require a pediatrician, but we can help them to the fact that they get to the pediatrician alive, then they can see over, take over. So what are the, the vital signs that we should know for any pediatric case? It is age dependent. After 12 plus, that is 13 year onwards, we consider them as adults because they're physiologically same, similar to adults. So we will see the duration from infants, that is uh, zero to 12 months, children that is one to 11 years, pre-teens and teens, that is 12 onwards. Uh, 12 onwards. So first you have a heart rate, respiratory rate and blood pressure. So your heart rate in infants is generally higher. They have a higher heart rate than us and normal is also 100 to 160. Uh, children, it is 70 to 120 and preteens, it is 60 to 100. That is similar to ours. Respiratory rate for zero to six months will be 30 to 60 breaths per minute and six to 12 months will be 24 to 30 breaths per minute. For one to five years, it is 20 to 30 breaths per minute and six to 11, 12 to 20. And again, 12 to 18 is what is there in adults. Blood pressure, zero to six months. Now they have a lower blood pressure, 65 to 90 systolic and 45 to 65 diastolic. Six to 12 months, they start getting, developing a higher blood pressure that is 80 to 100, 100 systolic and 55 to 65 diastolic. Uh, children may 90 to 110 and 55 to 75 and in adults again the same 110 to 135 and 65 to 85 diastolic blood pressure. Uh, something I want to add here is most government setups don't have a pediatric cuff especially in the casualties unless it's a tertiary care center. So if you're somewhere in say JJ but you're in the casualty you may or may not have a BP cuff for children. So it depends. So a lot of the times you'll only be able to measure their pulse, saturation and respiratory rate. Now, airway obstruction. So airway obstruction is actually, you can have an acute airway obstruction and a chronic airway obstruction. Acute airway obstruction are the first two causes here. That is foreign body aspiration, which is the most commonest cause of airway obstruction in children. And then there is airway swelling due to anaphylaxis, epiglottitis and all. The mass that compromises the airway lumen, that is a pharyngeal, peritonsillar abscess, retropharyngeal abscess and malignancies are generally slowly developing. So that will come under chronic airway obstruction. Uh, thick secretions obstructing nasal passages also will be cross up, not acute also, but it will not exactly be chronic or not very slowly developing. Uh, congenital will obviously be chronic and iatrogenic is also seen afterwards it's seen very late it does not present itself very acutely it will be a subacute uh, stenosis or subacute obstruction most important in children obviously is your uh, foreign body uh, foreign body aspiration because that is what is commonly seen something like food and very commonly coins children have a habit of picking up whatever they see around and swallowing it because that is a sign of nutritional deficiency in them but that they have a habit of taking a picking up things and eating whatever they can. And that is commonly the most common cause of obstruction. And if you do have a foreign body obstruction, you assess the severity. So if you have an effective cough, we will encourage them to cough it out. But if it is ineffective and you have unconscious, take it as any unconscious patient and start giving five breaths and CPR. But if it is, if they are still conscious, you can try the back blow method or the five thrusts and uh, five thrust method in the abdomen, chest in infants, uh, and abdominal for children less than, more than one year old. Um, so this is a video. They're going to demonstrate how to do these back blows and chest thrusts because. This is life-saving information that even you can teach to the parents itself. So, is the video visible to you guys? No active intervention. Take the baby to hospital for detailed evaluation and treatment. Or if there is complete obstruction, you should take the baby. First, you should sit in a chair comfortably. Take the is baby. it audible? With the yeah. two fingers on the mala prominence like this, keep the mouth open and in the left side and keep 
take the baby on your forearm and you should keep the left leg straight and keep the baby on your left thigh. The headache should be lower and with the right hand you slap on the interscapular area five times. This is back slap so that the chest is now acting like a bottle with a cork. That cork is the pore body. It stands air inside. So a slight pressure increase will kick the pore body out. So that is the principle of five back slaps. After five back slaps, hold mm -hmm. by the neck on the right side and just turn the baby to the opposite forearm with the two hands in, uh, on either side of your arm. Keep on the left side with head and lower and give five chest thrust. Just, just below the nipple line, in the center of the sternum, five compressions, just like we know CPR. So this should be continued again and again till the foreign body comes out or till the baby becomes limp and unresponsive. If the baby is unresponsive, you should assume that hypoxia has progressed and there is cardiac arrest. At that point, you should keep the baby on a flat surface, firm flat surface and give cardiac compression. We are sure that it is almost cardiac arrest, so there is no need of checking pulse, no need of checking breathing. You just go start with the cardiac compression. As I mentioned earlier, 30 compressions and two breaths. When we are giving breaths, you can open the mouth and see if there is any foreign body. If there is foreign body, you can remove. No blind sweeps are advised. Only visible foreign body is there, you can remove and give two breaths and again continue compression. This is the management of foreign body in a young baby. This should be continued till there is return of spontaneous circulation. In an older patient, uh, about let's say three or four years, hemorrhage manual is the method to uh, remove the foreign body by aspiration. For that, consider this as an older patient. So the universal talking sign is like this. So they will hold with the two hands on the chest and uh, on the throat and they will be very apprehensive. No sound will be there and they will not be able to speak. So ask if such a uh, situation of the ask have you aspirated for your body. If they uh, turn the head you can act. So for that you should keep the patient in front of you with the hand foot slightly apart. Keep your foot in between and make a fist like this. So this flat surface of the fist should be on the abdomen in the midway between umbilicus and the cephis channel. So keep like this with the other hand hold like this and you thrust up and back thrust with force so that the foreign body gets ejected out. This can be repeated many times till it comes out or till the patient becomes limp and hypotonic. If the patient becomes limp and hypotonic, start foreign body aspiration resuscitation in a patient. If there is partial obstruction, that means strider is there, cough is there, that is, that cough is the best method. And watch for progressive obstruction characterized by muffling of voice and stoppage of cough. When there is that. Okay. Uh, did you guys understand what she did in the video? <laughs> yes, no. Do you want me to play it again? Okay. Uh, Priyanka, you want to take over again? 
So another cause of airway obstruction we have epiglottitis. Now epiglottitis is a severe infection of the epiglottis, uh, classic which is most commonly caused by Haemophilus influenza in children. Uh, classical signs are dysphoria, dysphagia, drooling, and distressed respiration. Also, you will have your normal signs of infection where they may have uh, high fever, lethargic, loss of consciousness. All of that is possible. Uh, then you have shock and difficulty breathing and characteristically it has an inspiratory strider and wheezing, drooling, hoarseness and choking. Now the inspiratory strider is because it is an extra thoracic obstruction, which when the pressure is increasing, it is causing the collapse of the airway. So that is why this is one of the most dangerous one, uh, dangerous infections in children because it can cause a complete collapse of the airway, which is also why they will be advised that do not insert anything in the airway because that will stimulate the collapse. Next slide. So it is a serious medical emergency in children and can be life-threatening, similar to a partial airway obstruction, but same. Do not insert anything in the child's mouth because it will stimulate the epiglottis to completely cause a collapse of the intrathoracic, uh, completely cause a collapse of the airway and that lead to a complete airway obstruction. If the patient stops breathing, ventilate with the mask and use oral airway always as a last resort. So your basic life training will be position the patient upright, avoid overstimulation and administer high flow oxygen at 8 to 15 LPM blow by. Do not use airway adjuncts unless you're completely sure that there is no airway and there's a complete collapse of the airway and that is our last, last resort. When... Now, next is asthma. Asthma is your a chronic uh, yeah, air inflammatory condition that is the commonest uh, condition in children and characterized by reversible and pa paroxysmal constriction of the airways with airway occlusion by inflammatory exudate. So basically it is a chronic inflammation that will sometimes have its, uh, I forgot what it's called. You will have repeated episodes of uh, inflammation. So characteristically you will have rapid breathing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, wheezing, Nighttime asthma episodes are very common, a chronic cough and a racing heartbeat. So whenever you have your rapid breathing, you will have wheezing sounds, you will have a shortness of breath and chest tightening. That is when you know you have an exacerbation of asthma at the time. And most commonly, it will occur at night only. Uh, another thing I want to add here, asthma is very, very common in children. You have to be able to identify the chest sounds. You should know what a wheeze sounds like. You should know what crept sounds like. And another thing to keep in mind is asthma is different from COPD. Asthma, the main thing be it's reversible. To usko bronchodilator doge, the patient will recover. However, in COPD, the patient will have uh, narrowing in such a way that even after giving bronchodilators, they will not go back to their previous uh, uh, healthy state. Or relatively healthy state. So asthma severity, we will uh, character asthma severity is divided on the basis of how often you're getting the wheeze. So if it is an infrequent episodic wheezing, that is wheeze lasting only for a few days with no interval symptoms, that is. Uh, there are free times between wheeze and cough free periods, then it is infrequent uh, wheezing. Then frequent wheezing will be when it occurs at least two to six times per week. And persistent wheezing is when it is occurring daily. So if you have infrequent episodic wheezing, you become a mild case of asthma. If you have frequent episodic wheezing, you have moderate case of asthma. And if the frequent still becomes persistent, that is, it's becoming daily rather than twice or thrice, a, twice to two to four times a week, then it becomes severe asthma. So based on this, you will classify your treatment as well. And uh, how do you keep track of how often they're having an exacerbation is? You tell the parents to keep an asthma diary, where every time they have an exacerbation, the parents will note it down. 
बिकॉज समटाइम्स दे विल रिकवर फ्रॉम दैट एग्जैसेबेशन वो यूजिंग दैट सेल्ब्यूटामॉल इनहेलर और यूजिंग रिलीवर थेरेपी सो इट्स इम्पॉर्टेंट टू स्टिल कीप ट्रैक ऑफ हाउ मेनी टाइम्स दर हैविंग दीज एपिसोड्स because not always they'll be coming to your casualty or coming to the emergency department for the same so this uh, sort of record can be kept by the parents itself uh this is a video that will uh, basically demonstrate the sounds Uh, so one thing i wanted to take away from this session at least if you don't remember anything else at least remember that if you can if the patient is asthmatic or in any respiratory condition for that matter if you have a silent chest if you can't hear any breath sounds that is a red flag that means there is no air entering the airways at all which means you have to escalate it you have to maybe intubate or make sure that the airway is patent because as soon as the patient reaches that stage they'll go into respiratory failure and uh, subsequently collapse so even if you don't remember anything that we've taught you remember that a silent chest is the most dangerous finding in a patient So, if you have a patient who is coming to your casualty or who is coming to the emergency with uh, who is coming to you in an emergency, you will first see whether they are moderate, severe, or they have life threatening uh, life threatening exacerbation at the moment. So, you will check your SpO two. You will check whether they are able to talk, and you will check their uh, PFR. But uh, although that is the best predictor, SpO two and ability to talk is easily done. then you have your age uh, age and heart rate and respiratory rate as well these three things are enough rather than waiting for pefr you will just do these three spo2 ability to talk and their heart rate and respiratory rate so your spo2 greater than 92% they are able to talk in age less than 5 if their heart rate is less than 120 140 and uh, respiratory rate is less than 40 and above that age heart rate greater less than 125 and respiratory rate greater less than 30 you are still in the safer zone you can just give it's a it's a mild it's a moderate exacerbation of asthma so you will give them salbutamol uh, by a space sir and uh, if needed then you may give prednisone in age greater than 5 years and less than 5 years you will decrease the dose maximum 40 mg however is in both both cases if you have severe asthma where it is less than 92 
but they they are not yet in the danger zone where they are they do they are you cannot see their respiratory effort failing you can see they are not agitated loss of consciousness they are not confused or anything where their spo2 is less less than 92% they are breathless to talk but they are still a conscious patient they still understand what you are saying then you will go for uh, you will give oxygen via a face mask and salbutamol again via an or uh, salbutamol via spacer or nebulized salbutamol and for all ages you will give prednisolone to decrease the inflammation because it is a inflammatory exudate that is causing your obstruction and life threatening where they have very poor respiratory effort where you can see that they are about to go into failure where they are exhausted agitation altered consciousness easily confused patients they have cyanosis and again as dr rupali said silent chest you will immediately call for an ambulance you will give them oxygen high flow oxygen at 8 liters per minute you can consider going higher also in such patients you will give nebulized salbutamol uh prednisone to decrease your inflammation and in extreme cases you can also give adrenaline at the same dose for anaphylaxis so that is again age dependent after you have given the prednisone if this uh, after you have given them a treatment if they are still not uh, you check their response after 15 minutes if they are a good response you can continue your salbutamol and prednisone is obviously in a tapered dose so you continue it for 3 days and you arrange for a follow up visit if they are very, still very poorly responsive then you will send them to a uh, send them to the hospital closest tertiary center repeat salbutamol hourly until they start improving and you will have to refer them to a higher center for further management very rarely you will have to intubate such patients but it is still a possibility so you have to be prepared for that okay so pediatric life support now this is the most basic pediatric life support your books if you check any book for pediatric life support it will still be very extensive but the basics that you need to know is if a patient is unresponsive you will first ask uh, you will first shout out for help so that you can call a second rescue or it is better in tandem but if you are the on, still the only rescue or you will first make sure that the airway is open whether they are breathing or not if they are breathing observe and reassess as necessary but if they are not breathing you will first give them their compressions and then call for help you will not wait to call for help and then give cpr you will always for even if you are alone the first thing you will do is you will start the rescue and after that you will call for the help so you have an unresponsive patient you shout for help if there's a second rescue available do it in tandem one person will call the emergency services and the ambulance and the second person will uh, assess the uh, assess the patient uh, assess the patient so you see whether the airway is open whether they are breathing normally if you have an unresponsive patient breathing normally then you just continue to observe and reassess as necessary and if the if the patient is not breathing normally or if you have a doubt whether they are breathing normally you start the rescue next slide so you give five rescue breaths in an infant you give mouth to nose or mouth to mouth and child you give mouth to mouth uh if unable or unsafe to uh, ventilate perform continuous chest compressions add rescue breaths as needed if there is a single rescuer call after you've given these five rescue breaths then you will call for the emergency services and if there's no way that you can still call for the emergency services just continue your cpr for 1 minute at the least before you call them if no signs of life observed if no signs of life are observed during the rescue breaths then you start with your chest compressions 30 chest compressions two rescue breaths again you can repeat the cycle as needed if there are signs of life or if they are responding to your treatment then you will can't you will just keep the child in a safe position and wait for emergency services if they are still not responding you keep the cycle going till either a rescuer comes or the child starts responding Please note that this is for asking purposes only. We'll need to look into this area in greater detail for you to become fully competent as a clinician, and this will be backed up by your own background reading and placement. For all details, you're advised to refer to the UK Resuscitation Council guidelines on the subject.
This video will cover the following areas, initial scene assessment, initial approach to the patient, basic airway management, identifying cardiac arrest, and cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR for short. We'll cover main points here and go into a little more detail later on. So initial scene assessment. For this, you'll be using a smart approach. So first we're looking at scene safety, and this includes appropriate personal protective equipment, PPE, infection prevention and control, and any dangers to you or those around you. For mechanism of injury, we need to include C-spine and catastrophic hemorrhage. So at this point, you should request help in whatever form you deem necessary. Regularly. Situations that may be present. And triage. Is this your only patient? So if we take an initial approach to the patient, we need to check for a response. And for that, we're going to look at the alert, verbal, pain, or unresponsive scale, or AVPO, for short. We'll then move on to basic airway management. So the first thing we need to do is look in the airway. Are there any foreign body obstructions? Then we'll open the airway, we'll size up and place an OPA, and we'll look, listen, and feel for breathing for up to 10 seconds. We're then going to provide five rescue breaths and then reassess breathing and check for a pulse. It's at this point that we're probably going to identify cardiac arrest if it exists. And that will mean that there's no breathing, there'll be absent pulses or pulse of less than 60 beats per minute in the pediatric algorithm. We'll then start CPR. And for this, you're going to use an appropriate technique dependent on the patient's age, have a ratio of 15 compressions to two effective ventilations a rate of 100 to 120 per minute, and a third of the depth of the chest. So now let's examine some of those areas in detail. So here we have a patient estimated to be around about six months old, and we're going to assume that we've been through the standard scene assessment, smart approach, etc., and we're looking at the initial approach. So remember, we need to check for a response looking at the AVPU scale. Hello? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? So then we've checked for a response from the child in a couple of different ways. We've used an auditory response both through speaking to the child and through the hand claps. And we've checked for a pain or physical response by squeezing the child's earlobe or by tickling the feet. There are, of course, other methods that you can use, but remember that the objective is to check the child's response without causing any injury to the child. So now we're going to look at the patient's airway and check for any foreign body obstruction, and we need to open the patient's airway. So we need to consider patient positioning in this instance. Now, because of the child's age, it means that their occiput is going to be a lot larger relative to the size of their body. And what that does is it takes the airway out of alignment. So we need to bring that airway back into as good an alignment as we can. And to do that, we're going to place something under the patient's shoulders. We're then going to size up and place an oropharyngeal airway or OPA. And remember that we need to size this from the angle of the jaw to the level of the incisors or to the gums, depending on the age of your patient. And unlike adults, we're going to insert it in a way that follows the anatomy of the oropharynx. We're going to do that so that we avoid damaging the soft palates at the roof of the mouth. So if we look at this in real time, we're going to look in the patient's airway. We're then going to reposition the patient so that we put the airway in neutral alignment. We're then going to size up an OPA and we're going to insert it anatomically to maintain that airway. So next we need to expose the patient's chest and then we're going to look, listen and feel for breathing for up to 10 seconds. no more than 10 seconds. Now here we're going to diagnose cardiac arrest and remember to do this we need an absent pulse or a pulse of less than 60 beats a minute according to the pediatric algorithm. In the event of cardiac arrest we're going to start CPR and we're going to use an age appropriate technique. For this age child we'd be using two fingers although for an older child we may use one hand or two hands depending on the size of the child concerned. And remember that we're going to use a ratio of 15 to 2 
at a rate of 100 to 120 beats a minute and a third of the depth of the chest. So that concludes our basic pediatric life support procedure. Remember that for all details, you need to look at the UK resuscitation. Okay, uh, did you guys understand what they were trying to explain? Like the AVPU scale, how do you assess if the child has any response? Did you understand the technique of the CPR? Yes, no, should I replay it? Okay. Moving on. We have acute febrile illness. Priyanka, you can take over. Okay, so this is a very interesting one according to me because febrile illnesses or acute febrile illness and seizure is not seen in adults or is very, very rarely seen in adults. But this is something that we are supposed to prepare pediatric uh, pediatric patients or we should be prepared for pediatric patients to have this and we need to prepare the parents for it. So in response to fever, how will your heart rate and respiratory rate change? Is your heart rate increases by 10 beats per minute and your respiratory rate will increase by 5 beats per minute for every degree of fever above 38 degrees centigrade. Uh, so if in a 12-month-old girl, so your corrected heart rate will become 125 and your heart rate is increasing. Or if it's only 1 degree increase or so 10 into 1, so that will become 150 and uh, your corrected respiratory rate will be 25, that is your upper limit, minus the uh, increase, that is your five. So five into one, uh, so it will become 20 uh, breaths per minute. Uh, acute febrile illness is uh, acute febrile illness. So you will see how will you check the temperature. You have your rectal temperature, tympanic temperature, oral temperature, and axillary temperature. Uh, depending on the kind of thermometer you're using, you will check all of these. Rectal and tympanic is not something we do in our casualty emergency or most of the time we will not be doing it. It is oral and axillary. Oral you can do only first if you do not have a mercury, mercury thermometer because uh, children cannot be explained very easily that do not bite down on the tip of it because it will cause a leak of mercury. So that is why we would prefer axillary and uh, axillary temperature, even though rectal temperature is the most uh, appropriate, is not appropriate, it is the most accurate temperature is your rectal temperature, it is not the preferred method. So we go for axillary in most cases. Oral temperature is where only if you can explain it to the child or the child is close at above 10 years of age where you can explain it to them that do not bite down on the mercury thermometer. And uh, secondly, uh, it is their own thermometer because uh, axillary is the one we will most commonly be using uh, if it is one thermometer to be used on all patients. If they have their own thermometer, then we can take an oral temperature. And most of the children that about 20% of the children that are presenting to the emergency department with fever will not be able to tell you, will not be able to give you an accurate enough history for you to point out what the, uh, what the cause of the fever was but you will still have a few further questions that you can ask, which will help you diagnose as to what is the cause of the fever and what is causing this acute febrile illness. So the history questions. So you have, uh, first you ask about the peak temperature, uh, the peak temperature and whether they have given any medication for it as well. Most of them will not be able to tell you the accurate temperature. They will just say it was very high or it was just a normal fever because normal fever, you have like back, viral infections, you don't have that high of fever. Bacterial infections, you have a very high fever. So when they are saying that nahi, nahi, bahut high fever, tha, you will be able to differentiate ki, hai. they had a very high fever and they have a peak temperature is not at this moment or if this is the peak temperature also you will be able to ask. Then you have your age. Now this is commonly seen between six months to six years of age. 
and uh, it is uh, and they may see the uh, that is the thing about uh, acute febrile illness in children is they may have a seizure because of this uh, illness you will also be able to differentiate whether they are having an acute febrile uh, whether they are having a tonic clonic generalized seizure or they are having a complex seizure that we'll see in the next slide so the uh, tonic clonic seizure you have the same signs the child will become tense and will begin to shake or twitch and they may be accompanied by eye rolling tongue biting and incontinence for the tongue biting you are supposed to prevent it by putting a mouth guard in their mouth to prevent the tongue biting because at some points the seizure can be so severe and the contraction can be so severe that they will bite their entire tongue off and will cause massive bleeding there have been cases where the entire tongue has been bitten off now this usually occurs in the first day of fever because uh, after that the temperature usually starts to come down because the first day will be your highest temperature but there are also cases where the temperature gradually rises uh, then you have constitutional symptoms that may be uh, that may help point it out so if you know it's respiratory that will be cough sore throat pulling of ears and earache gastrointestinal they'll have diarrhea abdominal pain vomiting and genital urinary dysuria increase frequency of urination and burning micturition all of these are signs of a genital urinary infection so now again so if you have a, a six month to five year old or six year old uh, uh, child whose temperature is greater than 38 degrees and they are seizing how do you know it is a simple generalized seizure it will last for less than 15 minutes and you will have only one seizure in 24 hours but a complex seizure will last for more than 15 minutes and will have you will have more than one seizure in 24 hours why we need to differentiate between simple and complex is because our management changes if it is a focal and complex seizure you will have to refer them to a higher center to figure out why they are having this problem and why they are uh, why they are seizing also it is such a long seizure they may have signs of other uh, other neurological uh, damage so you will again have to do a ct and everything so focal complex seizures requires uh, referral to a higher center simple generalized seizure is something that you can see so how will you manage a simple generalized uh, seizure due to an acute febrile illness you will follow your abcd that is airway breathing circulation disability and exposure approach then monitoring the child and preventing injuries because if they are seizing you need to prevent the same the cushioning the head you will give them a mouth guard if they are seizing so that they do not or uh, you will do suction you will uh, give them a mouth guard so they don't bite their tongue off you will do suctioning so that there is no way causing an obstruction paracetamol or ibuprofen we will give to reduce the temperature at that time but this will not prevent a recurrence from occurring Uh, and you have to explain this to them that in in children between six months to six years of age, it is possible that a febrile illness or a fever is causing the seizure. But this we are taking care of them to the best of our abilities. And if the seizure is lasting for more than five minutes, you can give a benzodiazepine rescue. and then follow status epilepticus management then you check the status epilepticus at what how much you have to give and what doses you have to repeat that you will see again in status epilepticus slide so basically this is the this is it for febrile illness where you have you have to just see that you have to just counsel the patient and their parents that this is something that happens in a febrile illness it is simple clonic seizure a simple tonic clonic seizure simple generalized seizure may occur we do not have to worry about it right now we are handling it but if it's a complex seizure do not try to handle it. you will handle the basics you will do your abcds you will prevent any injuries you will give them paracetamol and you will refer them to a higher center uh coming to status epilepticus so this is what you call seizure disorder akdi jisko bolte hain and these kids either they're having their first episode of seizure which is going to be different from a febrile illness if the patient is a febrile and having tonic clonic seizures or absent seizures you will start moving towards status epilepticus right that's the difference uh so how do you manage these kids you always start in any emergency if you go back to the first lecture i took you always start with the abcs you check the airway you give high flow oxygen if needed then you check blood glucose because one of the commonest causes of status epilepticus in children is hypoglycemia so if the blood sugar level is less than 3 you give 2 mg per kg of 10% glucose 
सो बेसिकली यू नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड कोई भी पेशेंट सीजर में आ रहा है उसका एच लेना बहुत जरूरी है इफ द सीजर लास्ट फॉर मोर देन फाइव मिनट्स सो यू हैव टू इधर पुट इन एन आईवी लाइन और यू पुट इन एन इंट्रा ऑशियस लाइन सो इफ यू हैवेंट हैड योर पीडियाट्रिक पोस्टिंग येट यू विल नॉट नो हाउ डिफिकल्ट इट इज टू पुट एन आईवी लाइन इन चाइल्ड इट टेक्स लाइक फोर पीपल टू होल्ड देर आर्म्स टूगेदर एंड देन इट टेक्स मल्टीपल प्रिक्स टू गेट एन आईवी लाइन इट कैन समटाइम्स टेक हाफ एन आवर टू वन आवर फॉर अ आईवी लाइन टू बी सेट अप सो यू डोंट हैव दैट मच टाइम इन अ स्टेटस एपलेप्टिकस केस what you can do is you can give intraosseous access that is in their usually their uh, below their knee near their shin you can give an injection directly so uh, if you have access you can give iv midazolam 0.15 0.15 mg per kg this can be done even outside the hospital so paramedics can give midaz outside the hospital if you don't have intraosseous or iv access you can give buccal intra intranasal or rectal even rectal diazepam is used very commonly in children so you can use buc buccal or intranasal midazolam 0.5 mg per kg um uh, okay so once you have given midaz the next thing you can do is you can either get an iv access right you achieve iv access or if you have no iv access you wait for 10 minutes if after 5 minutes the patient is still seizing then you can repeat your midaz you can give another round of midazolam Again at point one five milligram per kg, then again you wait for five minutes. If the patient is still seizing, you move up and you move up the ladder to a levetiracetam, IV levetiracetam, forty milligram per kg. Or if the patient was already on levetiracetam, then you give phenytoin. So you have two options: levetiracetam or phenytoin. अगर बच्चा already phenytoin पे था तो levetiracetam. अगर phenytoin पे नहीं था to ulta basically you have two options you give the other one the one that they were not on <laughs> right so after 5 minutes if the patient is still seizing your next line becomes phenytoin or levetiracetam basically you switch it and you move towards intubation because a child should not be seizing continuously for so long so you have to move on to rapid sequence intubation followed by benzodiazepine infusion or you can add a fourth line convulsant this is different from adult status epilepticus because one our drugs are different two our access is different in a adult you are more likely to give iv uh, midaz directly because it's easier to establish an iv line in them okay this is the gist of what you need to know for status epilepticus midaz midaz ke baad two rounds of midaz midaz doesn't work levetiracetam or phenytoin these are your four drugs if you know these it's good enough okay another very common emergency seen in children is uh, allergic reactions i remember i myself had like a 13 year old boy who had come with an allergic reaction to the medication he had been prescribed in the opd itself so an allergic reaction can happen to food items to drugs to uh, dust a lot of things and what you will see is something called as hives urtic area which are these elevated bumps on the skin that you can see here on the skin and on the face they'll come with severe itching all over the body so how do you differentiate between an insect bite or a allergic reaction is in an insect bite you will have localized itching and redness over only the bite air, the bitten area whereas in an allergic reaction you will have generalized hives generalized itching overall facial swelling the limbs are swollen and you will also have a rash now an allergic reaction is different from anaphylaxis in anaphylaxis you will have respiratory difficulty their airway starts to collapse how we had understood in the uh, cpr part you have to check for breath sound so what you will hear is a stridor and you look for signs and symptoms of shock so how do you treat these children uh, what you can do is you can give an adrenal or epinephrine 1 is to 1000 0.15 mg laterally in the thigh im which is the easiest thing to give to a child and you can also give a, a duoneb nebulizer for the wheezing you can repeat this twice if there is no symptomatic relief 
and even if now the patient is still continuing to have difficulty in breathing you move on to basic life support if after this you you continue basic life support you can also give them diphenhydramine or benadryl 1 mg per kg slow iv or intraoscious you can also give im if you don't have any venous access the next option you have is methylprednisolone called solumedrol 2 mg per kg and uh, it's okay if you don't know all the doses there is a slide at the end that has all the essential doses that you need to know in allergic reactions at least remember the dose of epinephrine that is 1 is to 1000 0.15 mg im and you can also give additional epinephrine if required okay moving on to head injuries uh we've essentially covered the medical emergencies that were your uh, asthma epiglottitis um, seizure disorders and all of that now we're moving a little towards the surgical side so a lot of children are obviously prone to injuries because bahar khelne jaate hain kahin se gir gaye etc etc the most important that you need to know is a head injury and why that is so is because in head injury you need to know when to escalate right ab tumhare paas koi head injury patient aaya how do you know that okay abhi isko patti karna hai sirf cleaning dressing karke bhej dena hai or i need to escalate to a higher center so the first thing you need to know is the pediatric gcs gcs is something i'm sure you must have heard even during your adult surgery postings what you need to know in children is because a child cannot be oriented to time place person right they will not know ki kahan pe hai kya chal raha hai so especially in pediatrics you will never mention child is oriented to time place person what you can know is their gcs so is the eye opening spontaneous is the motor response um, appropriate are they able to localize pain is the verbal response appropriate so this slide especially is very important if you ever come across a pediatric emergency because you can immediately refer to it so if the child is crying grunting so what what level are they on on the gcs and things like that so how do you know that this head injury patient needs to be escalated there is something called the catch rule what it means is this patient is high risk and it and they need uh, immediate neurological intervention so if they've had a gcs score less than 15 two hours after the injury if they have a suspected open or depressed skull fracture if they have a history of worsening headache ki gire fit theek the thode time ke liye and then tab se ek do ghante baad sar dard ho raha hai aur badhte ja raha hai irritability then medium risk any sign of basal skull fracture so what you see is a raccoon eyes or battle sign i'll show you an image in the next slide and you will have a hematoma of the skull because the children's skull and scalp itself is much softer than an adult's so you will be able to easily appreciate a hematoma and if it's a dangerous mechanism of injury so they fallen from a bicycle or uh, they fallen from a staircase and things like that so this slide again very important trivial minor or moderate severe head injury trivial gcs 15 no loss of consciousness small frontal hematoma but no other signs of traumatic brain injury minor head head injury this is around 85% of the head injuries that you see gcs is between 14 to 15 there is some loss of consciousness amnesia or confusion and they are a little disoriented they can also have other symptoms like vomiting and headache and a seizure on impact the last one the moderate severe head injury is what you should know gcs is less than 13 or deteriorating that when you got the patient they came to your casualty say the gcs was 14 and around 2 hours later they've gone to a gcs of 9 that means they are neurologically rapidly deteriorating if they have a penetrating head injury or any focal neurological signs so if they have weakness of a limb or they're having a seizure late impact and if there is a history of child abuse so you have to be able to assess these child children very well so what you see on your right is your battle sign so when you have a depressed skull fracture you see this bluishness behind their ear 
that and the uh, swelling and blueness around the eye. So, uh, high risk, basically what you need to take away from the head injury topic is what is high risk? Skull fracture, signs of base of skull fracture, worsening signs and symptoms, dis deteriorating GCS. You have to immediately send them to a higher center or get se senior clinicians involved. If you have an immediate risk or a low risk, then your approach will be different. If it's an immediate risk, you consider imaging and you get a senior clinician to review. If it is low risk, you can discharge the patient with a follow-up advice if they deteriorate suddenly. Okay. Dehydration. Priyanka, you want to take, a, take over from here? Dehydration and DKA. Okay. So dehydration, again, this is commonly seen, very commonly seen in children. And uh, it is considered as an emergency in children. Uh, so how will you classify your dehydration is uh, severe, only some dehydration and severe dehydration. If there's no dehydration and they're still feeling very thirsty and everything, just give them fluid zinc supplement and uh, food to treat, uh, food to treat the diarrhea. Uh, advice mother when to return immediately. That is if the diarrhea is worsening or if the signs of dehydration are worsening uh, and follow up in five days, if not improving, if they are a known HIV case that is symptomatic or, a con uh, or symptomatic or, or non-symptomatic, you follow up in two days, if not improving. Now, what is some dehydration? They will be restless, irritable. They will have sunken eyes, which is the uh, sunken eyes and skin pinch, uh, skin pinch goes back uh, clear, slowly. These are the two signs we use very commonly to classify our dehydration. And this is the, what we use in children to classify dehydration. Uh, so sunken eyes and skin pinch uh, check, very, uh, check regularly if you're uh, suspecting dehydration and then drinks eagerly or thirsty. You have some dehydration, uh, gives fluid, zinc supplement and uh, food for some dehydration and see whether they are in the classification of uh, only some dehydration or severe dehydration. And if they are severely dehydrated, you need to urgently refer them to the hospital. If you have uh, infants, then you will continue the you will advise the mother to continue breastfeeding and if they are on supplemental feeds, you will tell them to give ORS as their supplemental feed. Uh, ORS is their supplemental feed. And again, severe dehydration, they will be lethargic or unconscious, uh, sunken eyes, uh, not able to drink or uh, drink properly and skin pinch goes back very slowly. There will also be some pruning of skin, which is seen. That is because your skin pinch is going back so slowly, it appears as pruned skin. Uh, management of dehydration, if there is none, then at a PHC level, you will just advise them at education and advice. You will advise them to continue breastfeeding and uh, usual milk feed and encourage a fluid intake. Uh, the flu uh, fizzy drinks, uh, carbonated drinks and fruit juices will be un uh, is not advised here or is unadvisable. And if there is a risk of dehydration for the supplemental feeds, you will give ORS, but your breastfeeding will continue, will always continue. If you have uh, if you have a severe or if you have severe dehydration or you have some dehydration that is mild to moderate dehydration that the child is presenting with, you will give ORS 50 ml per kg over four hours. Uh, over four hours plus maintenance and requirement is the same as uh, continuing the best feeding and supplement mental feeds and their normal fluid intake. So, so you have your normal fluid intake. Additionally, you will give your ORS 50 ml per kg over four hours. If they're not able to tolerate oral fluids, you will give either nasogastric, you will give nasogastric fluids and you will give IV fluids, which is again based on maintenance and correction. And you will see for rehydration. If they are in shock, if the, uh, if the ba baby is presenting or the child is presenting with shock, you will immediately establish an intravenous axis if possible. If not possible, intraosseous axis and give 20 ml per kg bolus of 0.9% uh, no, normal saline. That is our normal saline that uh, we get. And if they are still not improving, you will repeat the fluid bolus, but not more than 40 ml per kg. That is not more than two rounds of IV bolus is to be given. And then again, you go to your IV fluids. Maintenance and corrections and look for rehydration. 
again if you have signs of shock if you have signs of severe dehydration the best thing to do is that start your treatment and urgently refer them to a tertiary care center where it can be seen in more detail uh i something i want to add here they used to always ask us in psm uh ors is not always available right so you might not get the sashi of ors especially if you are in um uh, interiors or if you are in villages where you don't have access to the uh, packets available so what you can explain to them is you take 1 liter of water 1 liter ka pani ka bottle uh ek ek mutthi uh, chini and do chamach uh, your uh, salt Yeah. it's essentially salt sugar water right so this is the most basic way of uh, rehydrating a patient and honestly it is life saving because the more you go towards arid areas you will see a lot of deaths happening because of dehydration especially because of lack of uh, access to clean water so do keep this in mind that something as simple as ors or patient education can be life saving there's also an alternative to ors which is surprising is coconut water you can give coconut water in place of ors as well it is the closest formulation to ors that we have that is naturally occurring because some patients if you're not if there is not a dehydration and we are just advising them for supplemental feeds instead of giving ors you can also give coconut water based on the patient preference or the parent preference actually right also because it's really high in electrolytes so it's very good for your body in general also so i would highly recommend everyone drink coconut water uh priyanka you can take over dk okay um so dk very common medical emergency uh, seen especially in children with type 1 diabetes mellitus um what happens to them is uh, especially wherever i have seen dk patients it's because either they ran out of insulin or whatever oral hypoglycemic they were on or they forgot to take do you reason hote in uh, adults it's mostly because there is a lack of access they run out of the medicines and चार दिन पांच दिन तक लिया नहीं सो देर शुगर शूट्स अप इन चिल्ड्रेन इट्स मोर लाइकली टू बी फर्गेटफुलनेस दैट द चाइल्ड यू नो पेरेंट इन पे इन अफ अटेंशन एंड द चाइल्ड फॉर गॉट टू टेक देयर इंसुलिन एंड थिंग्स लाइक दैट सो दीस पेशेंट्स विल कम टू यू विद पॉलीयूरिया पॉलीडिप्सिया वेट लॉस अबडोमिनल पेन वॉमिटिंग कंफ्यूजन एंड दे विल हैव क्लिनिकल साइंस ऑफ डिहाइड्रेशन दैट इज द रीजन व्हाई आई पुट डिहाइड्रेशन बिफोर डीके is because you should be able to identify dehydration in any child then they'll have a deep sighing respiration like even in uh, medicine i had shown you the husserl's pattern of breathing and things like that there is a smell of ketones and they're lethargic any child who's becoming lethargic again is a red flag children are usually alert and cranky if they are becoming lethargic if they're becoming unresponsive again you need to uh, escalate to your seniors then you check their blood glucose level above 7 yeah, above 11 millimoles per liter and acidemia ph less than 7.3 or bicarb less than 15 you also check for ketones in urine or blood urine ketones is the easiest thing to do that can be done bedside all you need is the box and a sample of urine and you can do their urine and electrolytes once you've got the diagnosis of diabetic ketoacidosis you will grade the severity of the disease so either it can be mild moderate or severe or the patient is in shock so a mild case will have a ph of uh, less than 7.3 right so that's how you know that okay the patient is relatively stable and they'll also be tolerating your fluids well they will not be as dehydrated so you can see how important just uh, you know assessing the fluid status of a pediatric patient is so in a mild case you don't need to give a fluid bolus you give subcutaneous insulin and you give oral rehydration as a rule of thumb when you are practicing as clinicians always prefer oral route of rehydration unless the patient has had vomiting and nausea and all of that because it's always better to go with the natural way in which your body digests food and fluids right 
keep IV rehydration only for cases where you feel there is a need for it. If these if these children do not improve after six hours, you move on to the moderate uh, category of classification, where you will give uh, IV therapy and keep the patient NVM. You have to calculate the fluid requirement and you have to correct the dehydration over 48 hours using NS. Your best fluid for rehydration in DKA is hands down 0.9 sodium fluoride. That is your NS. It is easily available, ubiquitous, and it works like a charm. After your first hour of fluid, you start giving insulin. So the mainstay of DKA in pediatrics and adults is fluid rehydration. Later on, you move on to insulin and potassium supplementation. Now, if your patient is in shock, that means they have hypotension, reduced level of consciousness and coma, you start with resuscitation. Again, A, B, Cs, airways, breathing and circulations. And if they're, you know, if they're going into bradycardia, you consider inodules. Now, you have to monitor these patients hourly. So, you have to do neuro neurological status and blood glucose levels. You have to check their vitals. You have to check for acidosis because these patients might deteriorate very quickly. So, if they're in acidosis, you add 5% glucose to NS and you add 40 millimoles of KCL and you continue the observation. How do you know that the DKA has become, uh, has resolved? Like the patient is now gotten better. You can assess it clinically. The child is clinically well, he's drinking, uh, you know, drinking fluids well, tolerating food. The pH has recovered, pH is above 7.3 and the ketones have reduced. Right? Uh, if the patient does not recover after six hours, right, there's no improvement, you have to reevaluate. You will again send ketones, you will check the fluid balance and you will do IV therapy. Right? So you'll have to check the insulin dose, you'll have to consider sepsis. Things like that. Now, if there is, if the patient was in shock and is undergoing neurological deterioration, it's getting more and more irritable, there is incontinence, the patient is going into bradycardia, if the patient is getting drowsy, right? Or you have specific neurological signs, you have to exclude hypoglycemia. Is the brain swelling? What you are checking for now is cerebral edema. So you have to escalate these cases to a senior and you might have to give mannitol. Mannitol, what it does is, it pulls the fluid from inside your brain. So, because of the dehydration, the osmotic pressure increase and your brain is swelling up. So, to reduce that swelling, you give mannitol. And you might have to shift the patient to ICU. Right? Okay. Uh, last slide, basically as I had mentioned before. Uh, these are some doses that you need to know in general because uh, you might be seeing uh, children in your day-to-day -day practice. So you should know what is the dose of paracetamol, what is amoxicillin, metrogel, dextromethorphan, diphenhydramate, and domperidone. These are very common complaints that uh, children with come, come with. Fever, obviously, we've already covered. Uh, infections and uh, nausea and allergic reactions, things like that. So do refer back to this slide if you ever come across pediatric patients uh, that require treatment. Okay, moving on to the cases. Uh, you have a 14-year-old boy who was brought in by the mother and she is worried that he had a seizure at home. On examination, pulse is 130, saturation is 99, temperature is 104. Can anybody tell me the diagnosis and how would you like to manage the case? And is there any other history you want to ask? Tarun, Terence, Purmi, febrile seizures, right. So this is a case of febrile seizure. In seizure patients, yes, you will also ask for HGT. You want to check if the seizure was triggered by hypoglycemia. In seizure patients, what you need to be sure about is if the patient definitely had a seizure or not. So a lot of the times, uh, you can ask the parents to record a video of the child having a seizure so that you know for sure it's a seizure and it's not any other neurological finding. Another thing you can ask is how long did it last for? Was there any tongue biting? Tongue biting is very characteristic of a seizure episode. Or if there was any loss of consciousness or amnesia, does the patient remember if they had a seizure or not? 
Uh, moving on to the management, of course, the main thing, the fever is triggering the seizure. So you will bring down the temperature as soon as possible. You'll give paracetamol. Okay, case two, a 10-year-old boy brought by relatives with complaints of breathlessness for two hours. Patient is a known case of asthma on salbutamol inhaler. I've given you the BP pulse saturation is 92 and respiratory rate 24. How would you like to manage the patient? Asthma, which category is the patient in? Is there any other history you want to ask? Is there any other examination that you want to do? Priyanka, ma'am, if you could help out the participants. Is there anything else you want to assess in this child? You're on mute. You're on mute. What is the characteristic finding we have in asthma? What will you find what, on examination? What What will you find exactly? Wheezing. Yeah. So you're, yeah. you're wheezing. So then you are seeing you have your SpO2 is greater than 92. You have your respiratory rate is less than 30. And you have your BP is less, uh, B, your pulse. Pulse is less than 120. So what category patient will this become? No. How will you classify this patient? Mild. So what do we give for mild patients? Okay. Good. So prednisone we can give. Another thing what we will give. The patient is already a known case of asthma and salbutamol inhaler. So in such an exacerbation, even if they're presenting to you what? Salbutamol. You will give a salbutamol inhaler, uh, eight, puffs per, uh, eight puffs, and you can give prednisone if you think it is a very acute exacerbation. Okay. Moving on to the third case. Eight-year-old boy brought to the casualty with history of fall from the stairs at home. Complaints of trauma to the occipital region. On examination, you have this finding. What would you like to do next? How will you manage this patient? Very simple case. You see this sign, you know what to do. Anybody? Sara, Tarun, Terence, Purmi. What am I suspecting here if I'm seeing this finding? Dr. Priyanka, maybe you can help them out. Hematoma, okay. Uh, a better answer than that. What is it more likely to be? Okay. Um, so this is a finding in a base of skull fracture. So what we call this is a battle sign. You also have something called raccoon eyes. I'd shown you pictures in the head injury uh, part of the session. What you need to do in these cases is immediately get an X-ray and a CT done to look for an underlying hematoma or any underlying neurological damage to the patient. Okay, very easy. Case four. Five-year-old boy is brought to the casualty by parents with complaints of itching and hives all over the body since one day. There are no complaints of difficulty in breathing. Pulse is 130, saturation 99, adrenaline. Okay, what else? Is there anything else you think the child might need? Yeah. 
you will also give them benadryl you can give them benadryl and if they have difficulty in breathing you will give them solumetrol okay last case a 10 year old girl known case of type 1 diabetes mellitus came to the casualty with complaints of vomiting confusion and dehydration since 4 hours on examination bp is 100 by 70 pulse is 120 saturation is 99 agt is 334 pH is seven point one two. How would you like to manage this patient? First of all, what is your diagnosis? DKA. Yes. How would you like to manage? Okay. Wait. Huh. Yeah, go ahead. For management, what is the first thing that you are seeing in DKA? You are forgetting one thing out here. What is your first thing in management that you see for DKA? That will decide your treatment. You you know that the patient is has diabetic ketoacidosis, but you have three types of management for it. pH. So pH here is what. Seven point one. So what is seven point one? It's a severe DKA. So what do you do for severe DKA? There's a very classical which even I have learned from Rupali Mamuni. DKA for DKA. So just remember DKA for DKA. That's even the method even I use now. It's the easiest way to treat DKA, and you will never go wrong with this. at least you can start your treatment for the treatment of dk is frankly not a textbook thing to learn but what is what is dk for dk i think you okay. have to explain it to them okay so you have your uh, what what all you need to do what all are the three things that we are doing you have to correct the acidosis you have to correct the potassium imbalance and you have to correct the dehydration okay and also you have to treat the diabetes with it so for the diabetes and dehydration you're going to give fluids and those fluids should have 5% glucose for your um, dehydration you're giving 0.9% sodium chloride and for your uh, uh, potassium imbalance you will give 40 millimoles per liter of potassium chloride and the further management of dk is basically you're just going to be between your kcl nacl and your glucose you're just going to be managing between these three so just remember dk for dk and you have to see your ph that is the thing for see your ph if your ph is greater than 7.3 then you give then they are right then you have to just give insulin to reduce the blood sugar because then they are not in risk for as they are not they do not have severe acidosis but here with 7.1 you have a very severe acidosis so you have to correct your acidosis you have to correct your potassium and you have to correct your dehydration so i'm correcting your for you hmm. have your diabetes dehydration you have your uh, potassium and you have your acidosis <laughs> another way of correcting your acidosis will be your sodium bicarbonate and everything once you rule out the underlying causes So first, just stabilize the patient with your three these three things. DK, just stabilize the patient on all of this. And also, abdominal pain. They will most commonly patients will either complain of abdominal pain or they will complain of heartburn. कि इधर जल रहा है, पेट पे जल रहा है. That's it. That will come. They will just come with that पेट में जलन and you will get your HGT so high. You might not have any of the signs. They might not have. Uh, the, they might not be short of breath. They might their SpO two will be maintained. They will be fine. They will be sitting up patients. The only complaint will be heartburn, and then you when you check your HGT, you will find out that their blood sugar is so high. So it can easily be seen that very often we will say heartburn ka patient hai, theek hai, unko antacid deke bejo. But only when we check the HGT will we find out that they are diabetic patients. Even they might not be aware that they have diabetes. uh and this actually happens a lot uh the other day when i was at work a patient patients are referred from the opd for us to check the hgt and this was an obese female around 45 50 year old who was sent for hgt checking and her sugar came out to be 460 something 
and she was fine she was completely fine she's walking around no symptoms she just came to take her monthly medications which had gotten over 5 days ago so you have to understand that you have to counsel patients in terms of not missing their diabetes and hypertensive medications because even a day that they skip the medication they can go into an emergency condition so always make sure that you counsel the patients properly and for pediatric patients see most of them do not have the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus so it's very rare that you will get a patient who child who's already been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes mellitus because these are not very obvious signs we know to ask for polyuria polydipsia they don't know that polyuria polydipsia is a sign of diabetes mellitus so you have to educate them for all of this and especially in children with polyuria polydipsia is difficult to find out a kid is bedwetting is a very normal thing you don't think of diabetes when you think polydipsia or polyuria hai right so it's again harder to diagnose in children as compared to an adult so on that note uh, we'll end the session be very careful with your diagnosis in kids and thank you for joining i hope you guys enjoyed the today's session thank you for dr priyanka's insights thank you and i'll send the recording and the post session form on the group thank you for joining bye bye